Okay, so uh, welcome. And now I'd like to kick off the, uh, formally kick off the Ed Forum with our first presentation. Um, and I uh, want to turn things over to Dr. Jeff Mattis and Elsa Bradley. Um, they'll be discussing long-standing patient-doctor relationships and how trust and communication can help to make the experience better for both the doctor and the patient. Um, Dr. Mattis is with the Colorado Blood Cancer Institute. He's been a featured speaker at several IWMF ed forums, and I know from personal experience he can always be counted on to give an exciting and engaging talk. He's, he's, a, he's, a, and he's a wonderful person on top of that, which is icing on the cake. Um, and uh, Elsa, Elsa Bradley is filling in for Bill Bass, who is originally going to do that. And they both happen to be Dr. Mattis's patients. Uh, and, um, but uh, he had some medical procedures done, not WM related, and he couldn't make it. Um, and so she, uh, uh, Elsa Bradley has had WM for 17 years, and she's here to share her insights and experience and, you know, how to uh, tell Dr. Mattis that he doesn't know what he's talking about at times, uh, <laughs> and vice versa, I guess. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that, um, uh, that together they will have a compelling, uplifting story that will help us all soar to new heights in our own relationship with our cancer doctors. Thank you. So th thanks, Peter, and thanks everyone for being here. I'm Jeff Mattis, and, and, and this is Elsa Bradley, the wonderful Elsa Bradley. And, and I just want to make a couple comments and let Elsa dive in, because you want to hear from the patients more than do the doctors in this matter normally. But uh, one of the things as a doctor when we're seeing a patient with WM is that we know we're entering, we're entering into a, what we hope is going to be a very long-term relationship. We saw that this morning, right, with all the people that have been diagnosed for so many years. And so it's a different relationship than you might have with your orthopedic surgeon who replaces your knee or the surgeon who takes out your gallbladder or your dentist. And so uh, uh, it's a special relationship. Uh, it really is a special relationship. And I think if you ask WM physicians what they really enjoy about their practice, it really is the relationships that we have with our patients over so, so many years. And so uh, that's just my introductory comment, Elsa. And I'm going to let you start off with maybe a little bit of your story, and then we can talk about what, what, what your perspective is on the physician-patient relationship, and we can okay. have a little discussion about that. Well, as uh, Peter said, I've had uh, WM diagnosed for 17 years. I was first diagnosed in 2007. My husband and I had retired, and we were full-time RVers. We happened to be working in Maine, and that's when I found out that I had something that was causing me to have anemia. Uh, I was not told uh, WM. I was told a type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so that's what I went with. And um, the doctor said, you can, because you're full-time RVers, you can be treated anywhere in the country. And we thought about going to Florida and uh, because that's where we were originally from, but we had lived in Colorado for 20 years, so we went back there. So we uh, almost flew across the United States. My husband was a little hyper, and you're not supposed to pull a full uh, fifth wheel more than about 350 to 400 a day, but he was doing close to 600, and we got there a day early because he definitely wanted me to see a doctor there. The doctor in Maine had arranged for Dr. Young in Colorado Springs to treat me. I was ready to go, and he gave me Rituxin, Cytox Cytoxin, Vincristine, and Prednisone. I had six rounds, and then he told me, because he'd only had uh, 10 patients with WM before me, and he did not say, he did not also use the term WM. He just said a type of non-Hodgkin's. Uh, he said, uh, you're free to go uh, move around the country in your RV, but uh, know this, that when it comes back, it'll come back differently, and you will definitely need a stem cell transplant. So, you know, that's what the doctor said, so I went with that. And so every time I had a twinge of anything, I'm like, is it back? Which is kind of scary. But 
that chemo lasted me five years. That's the good news. And then I still didn't know that it was WM, but I was, we were in Arizona for the winter in our RV, and the, Leuke the Lymphoma Foundation had a blood cancer day. And I went and I looked at all the choices that I could put on my name tag, and none of them fit, so I put other. <laughs> and so I went to the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma um, uh, session. And she started talking, and I listened. And when it was done, I looked at Gary, and I said, I shouldn't be here. This is, something's wrong. So I went and talked to her, and I described what I had been given for my chemo. I described my symptoms. And the a presenter said, you have WM. And I said, oh, there was a WM session this morning, but I didn't go there because I didn't know that I had that. So she said, not to worry, after lunch, there's more of the WM. He's presenting again, so you, you're in luck. That was the worst lunch I'd ever had. <laughs> I was so angry. <laughs> and I walked in, and uh, I didn't see a gentleman right outside with uh, a lot of IWMF material because, again, I was just focused on getting in there and finding out what I needed to know to move forward. And he did the presentation, and I think the doctor was trying very hard to put me at ease, so he said, uh, and as you all know, this is mostly in older men. And I think he just wanted me to laugh, you know, just to kind of... <sighs> And after when I went outside, and it was Bill Bass, the support group leader for Colorado, Southern Wyoming, and he had, and he also did Arizona, so he had all of the IWMF material, and I took everything. And I called, joined that day, and found out a year later that there was going to be a summit in um, Disney World in Orlando. So we were going to be in Florida the following winter, so we went to that session, and there was a guy walking around named Roy Parker, and he had on his badge, Denver, Colorado. And I walked up to him and I said, we're going to be coming off the road soon. Can you please tell me uh, if there's a good uh, oncologist in Denver that is familiar with WM? And he said, Jeff Mattis, and the rest is history. So Jeff and I have been together for 12 years mm -hmm. fighting my cancer, or should I say just challenge, challenging, finding it challenging, that's for sure. And Jeff thought that after he saw me that I would probably need um, sometime in April, this was like October, he said, I think sometime in April of 2013 you're going to need uh, chemo again. And so we started on Rituxan. I told him that I'd had some negative experiences with Rituxan where my blood pressure totally tanked. Uh, and they had, in the first time, they had to put me in the hospital for 24 hours with a slow drip, and that turned out great. And I was able to, you know, stay untreated for five years. Well, my body recognized that Rituxan and remembered before and didn't like it and really, you know, so my blood pressure tanked. So Jeff decided to put me on off of Tumab, and I didn't know it, but he only gave me a sample. Well, the sample was enough, and my blood pressure tanked. And he reached his head in the door and said, that's it, no more off of Tumab, no more Rituxan, you're done. So he finished with the bendamustine for the four times, and that was pretty good for two years. And then we were looking at clinical trials, and right then the FDA approved ibrutinib. So I went on ibrutinib for quite some time, but I had some issues with pneumonia, which caused AFib and pleural effusions. And so we stopped the ibrutinib, and when we did go back, we only went back to 280 milligrams. So I had a feeling that it wasn't going to last as long as the first time, and it went about two years. And then we were going to do another clinical trial, but you have to wash out 
of your ibrutinib. So for 30 days, I was off the ibrutinib. And I got worse and worse and worse. And I would wake up in the morning going, my brain is telling me I shouldn't be doing this. And I was starting to get very upset. My husband was, was upset. We, we both knew I had to do that in order to be on the clinical trial, but we also knew that I was in a bad way. And about a week before I was supposed to go in the hospital to start the clinical trial, I went in to see Jeff. He took one look at me and said, we are admitting you right now. So I was in the hospital for quite some time. Um, we tried the clinical trial after they stabilized me. It made me worse. So then we tried uh, bendamustine and obinutuzumab. And he gave me what, six, was it six doses of that? And then he thought I should do, he should do maintenance with me. So that's what uh, we did. And my last maintenance was in June of last year. And the obinutuzumab has lowered my IgM into the 200s. I've never had numbers like this before. However, because you know, there's always something. He likes to say that if you don't have a symptom, we have a chemical that'll give you that symptom. <laughs> and sure enough, sure enough, my neutrophils tanked. Yeah. <laughs> because you have to have something to worry about, right? So I started with the little packs. I call them the glide packs, where they put it right here. And then you, the next day, you get that jolt, and you know you've had it. And uh, that was fine until it started leaking and leaving burns on my arm. And that wasn't fun. So now they're giving me shots in my stomach. And it was, what, every three weeks and the last time Two weeks ago was uh, every two weeks. And my neutrophils do very well with the shot for about a week. And then when I go back in for a blood check, my neutrophils tank. So any of you doctors out there know anything about how you get your neutrophils up and get them to stay up? We'd love to know that. That is a quandary. Since yours doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, it's, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah. you really have to have a good relationship with your doctor. You have to have a doctor that listens, and I'm blessed with that. You have to have a doctor that's willing to collaborate with the patients, which Jeff does a wonderful job with that. So I trust him explicitly, but we do have that little neutrophil issue now we're trying to work through. We'll get there. That's yeah, a, no. Uh, so, so there are different... You know, patients look for different things when they're working with physicians. And I think as a WMer, again, you're entering into a, a, a hopefully a long-term relationship. And so you need to have certain things in place to make that relationship feel good. Because I think of all the things that have been examined in research studies with the physician-patient relationship, trust is, always comes out as number one. You have to trust your physician. And, and, and that's the big thing. And, 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 you, and you can trust the physician the WMers out there who only have a, there's some, most docs in practice only have a couple WMers in their practice. So Elsa El was telling me, hey, my guy had 10. That doesn't seem like very many. I said, 10's a lot for a, a general uh, hematologist oncologist managing WM. But if that doctor is engaging, willing to seek out uh, 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 additional opinions, uh, listen, follow up, uh, and, and stay on top of things to take the best care of you, then, then that's, that's a great trust, and that's how most WMers receive their care. Most WM patients are not cared for at the Dana-Farber by Jorge Castillo and Shana and Steve, or, or at the Mayo Clinic with Maury Gertz or Prashant Kapoor, you know, or not every, not every Seattle WMer sees Mary Kwok, right? And most of those patients are out in, in, in the community oncologist. And so if that doctor has your trust that they're going to advocate uh, on their, for, for you on their best, that, that, that's the key element for the relationship. Other patients, when they're looking for a physician, uh, my, my mom, I was telling Elsa, my mom, uh, who's, who's 20 years past this, this, this June, uh, her, her thing was she, she wanted the doctor to tell her what to do. She didn't, you know, and that's, that's what she did. You know, the doctor, just, that was that generation, right? Do this, you, you do that. And that's more the paternalistic uh, model of a physician-patient relationship. 
But other patients are looking for different things, like looking for doctors that inform or educate, right? That, that's an important thing. Now, in WM, you're lucky that if your doctor can't inform or educate too much, that you have IWMF, which is a phenomenal asset to you. But, but I think some patients really need that, that education and that uh, uh, to, to feel really good about their relationship with their physician. Others just want to have that, that, the cordial relationship. They want to feel like their physician is uh, um, someone with whom they can have a casual conversation where they're not intimidated, right? So with most of my patients, the veteran WMers, I go by Jeff, and if they call me Dr. Madison, I would call Elsa Mrs. Bradley. You know, if she, if she were to do that to me, then she'd say that's, that was my, you know, it was Gary's mom's name, right? And so, uh, <laughs> anyway, so it, it, it's that kind of relationship that some patients are looking for as well. So everyone's looking for something different. And the key for, for you is just to have that comfort level with your physician where, again, the primary thing is trust. So Elsa, when you were looking for medical care, I mean, you, you, you were an incredible advocate for yourself, right? I mean, you went and you were, you were researching on your own. You went to Lymphoma Research Foundation meeting in, in Arizona. You went to the, uh, uh, the conference in, the physician patient, the conference in, in Florida. You sought people out. So you're super aggressive. At, uh, at, at finding information for yourself. So what, and you, what was the most important thing when you were looking to establish medical care long-term with someone? I wanted somebody that really was familiar with WM. Okay. And, and so, and then what would you say to people who, you know, don't live near a center where there's, or close to where there's a WM physician? To, when you're looking for a doctor, or when you have a doctor, who is not that experienced, make sure that you communicate to them that it's really important to you that they connect with somebody who's had experience. And it doesn't, you know, in this day of everything online, it doesn't even have to be an expert that's that close. You can, you can contact one of the experts at uh, Dana-Farber or at Mayo and, uh, you know, they, y your doctor needs to be comfortable enough that they're not so old school that they don't want to, you know, they are the expert and they will treat you and they don't need a second opinion from anybody. That's not going to help you in your WM journey. And the reality is we're all living longer with WM. When I was diagnosed, they said five years, and now, you know, look at us. So they have to be comfortable enough to realize that once they treat you, it's not one and done. You're not going to just, that's it, bye, have a good life. That, that everything that you do and all of the different treatments that I've had worked till they didn't. And that's just... WM, and that's the way it's going to be, for now anyway. I mean, yes, we'd like to imagine a cure, but right now. So you, they need to be able to be comfortable. The doctor needs to be comfortable enough in their own skin to consult with somebody who knows a little bit more about it. And you're not, it's not like you're saying, you don't know what you're doing. You're just saying, here's somebody that's had a lot more patience. It's the same thing they say about surgeons and how many uh, operations that a surgeon does. You're looking for a surgeon that's done more than three, right? And you definitely don't want them to say as they're putting you under, well, this is my first time, but I, I feel confident. <laughs> I mean, and there's a great session tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, Newton, on second opinions on, uh, with a great physician panel talking about that as well. And second opinions can be obtained in so many different ways. Now, Who's familiar with the fact that IWMF has an information sheet for physicians about WM? Yep. It's on there, right? And so, and, 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 and I've had patients uh, who have gone to doctors and, and consulted Dr. Google, who's a very commonly utilized <laughs> doctor, as we all know. But, and, and sometimes they'll say, hey, I, I sought information, I presented it to my, to my physician, and they were put off by it. So if that happens, you're in the wrong place. You know, and so, but so most physicians would, would, would to have something like that available to them for a rare lymphoma that they may have two or three or four patients in their practice with that diagnosis and get this authoritative document and written by 
leaders in the field in, in Waldenstrom, macroglobulinemia, I think should welcome that with open arms. And so that, that's a great resource out there uh, for physicians or for the staff where you're treated as well. So. And we like to mention to doctors, even if it's a doctor like a cardiologist or a pulmonologist or any doctor that my husband and I have, we do mention to them about the IWMF. And I think every uh, doctor that treats WM patients should know about the IWMF and also advocate that to their patients. Absolutely. And not all do, and we're always surprised when we come across someone who, who does it. And we went back to Maine a couple of years ago and thanked the doctor who first diagnosed me. And he vaguely had heard about IWMF, so we gave him some information to give to patients because Maine has a lot of uh, uh, blood cancer patients there. And I think it has to do with the granite. But so the, the, no, so really. what about the communication? So I mean, trust is the major thing we talked about. But communication, and communication for me is not just when you're in the room with your physician or, or your you know, nurse practitioner who's ever seen in the clinic that day. Uh, I think communication is broader than that in, in, in medicine. And I think that in WM, uh, it involves having a team. And that's one thing certainly at our center that we really try to put in place for our patients is to have a, a, a team that's there for the patient, always communicating with the patient. And so what are you looking for when, when or what, what advice would you give uh, a patient when they're, we have some newbies here, right? Some, some newly diagnosed patients. When they're in the room, what, what are some, what's some good advice when they're interacting with their provider with respect to communication? What should the patient be looking for? Well, you should always have some questions and you might start when you go home from your initial visit, start writing them down because invariably there's something you forgot to ask the doctor. Uh, you can always, if they have a, somebody that will, uh, you call it nurse navigator, somebody that uh, will do some things and kind of be a bridge between you and the doctor, mm -hmm. you can always call them or text them or email them with questions. If you, uh, I know some people have portals that they can uh, ask questions and directly message the doctor. Uh, for years, I would email him but it was never about myself. It was all, because I'm the co-support uh, group leader with, with Bill, it was always about IWMF stuff, our support group. And I, I said to my husband, this is really strange. I never ask him anything about my cancer. It's always about um, chapter business. But um, you, should have, you should always be prepared with questions. And then there should be a way that you can, like I said, text or email so that if it's something really pressing and you're not gonna see your doctor right away, that you have that communication. There should be some, something other than necessarily a phone call. I like emails because, or a text, because if the doctor isn't available to answer right then, they can you know, get back. And he's wonderful about getting back. So, so I, there have been that. studies done that have looked at when a patient sits down in the room with a physician and the physician asks the first question, how, long, how much time elapses before the physician interrupts the patient? Okay, the, the, this, these studies have been done. And it's less than one minute. And so I, I think if you're a patient and you really want to advocate for yourself, there's something on your mind, a really, really good advice is to come in with a, a written piece of paper with your questions and, and, and to say, okay, do, do you mind first, I have a couple of questions, can we just get these taken care of? Because once the doctor gets on his or her role, you know, with <laughs> I'm gonna ask you some questions, do you need any medication refills, let's look at your labs, um, brief exam, see you later. You know, the next thing you know, you walk out and, and you forgot to ask your questions. So I think if there's something really, really important to you, write them down and then and, and let your doctor know when he or she enters the room, it's like, hey, there's some things that are really important to me uh, can, we, can we tackle these? And I've even had patients come in where I had an agenda for the visit, which is I wanted to address point A, B, or C, and the patient had a completely different agenda. And then it, the visit will change course. And, and, and it'll be where maybe I didn't get my exam done or 
it didn't review what I wanted to review, but we got what the patient wanted to know taken care of. And so it's really important to advocate for yourselves. Now, when you're doing well, there's not much to say to your doctor when you're doing well with your Waldenstrom's, but what if you're not doing so well? You know, what if you're on a BTK inhibitor and your numbers are getting worse and you're going, good Lord, what do I do after B, what are my options after BTK inhibitor? What, when are you gonna to need to retreat me again? Um, can you ever just do this or do that? You know, all these things run in your mind. And it, again, it's really important, I think, to, to write them down and, and you're very good at that. We, when you have questions, you're very, very good. And a lot of questions you ask me are unanswerable, of course. Uh, but uh, but, but that is, uh, that's a really, really good habit, I think, to get inf the information that you need from your physician. That, that's what I think. So, Peter, did we want to open it up for questions at all? Did, was, was there any, was that part of the session to do that? Or you just want else to keep rolling? No, we no we we're, we're, we got we we can talk more for sure, <laughs> and so anyway, great. So, uh, so 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 as a doc, again, I think that ideally you you want a doctor who's who's going to listen to you, who's going to if they don't know the information he or she's going to find the information, and who's receptive to any advocacy that you've done on your part. Uh, uh, because you have a three in a million lymphoma. You know, you guys, it, it, they're, they're, you just have a rare lymphoma and, the, and if you bring information to the physician, they should be uh, pretty open to it. But I do have to say that as a physician, again, I said this at the very beginning, that if, if you were to talk to Dr. Trotman or Dr. Kwok or Dr. Castillo or Dr. Thomas, any of the doctors that are gonna be here, what they enjoy most about WM, the fact is that they're here. And, and so WM, WM doctors love taking care of WMers because it's such an amazing relationship that we have over, over so many years with our patients. And so that's the way certainly it's gonna be for us. And, and, and again, with your, most of you are not gonna be cared for by WM specialists directly, but I do think that, again, the, the key element is to have that comfort level, that trust to feel like you're heard have a person in the office with whom that you can contact when you need to contact someone if there's an issue, not be afraid to ask questions, and also not be afraid to advocate for yourself because the chances are, if, if, you, if you're a WMer and, and you're getting treated with rituxan, for example, your physician may not know about something called IgM flare. Or if you're on abrutinib or xanabrutinib, they may not know that if you stop those medicines suddenly, that you could have a flare of your symptoms, or they may not know that those medicines need to be stopped around an operation, depending on the operation. So if there's information you have, don't be afraid to come out with it and, and help educate your doctor. We love, one of the great things about medicine is we're always getting educated. So anyway, I thought Elsa did a fantastic job. <laughs> So, Peter, are we off the stage officially now? I think so. Okay. <laughs> okay. You did a fantastic job. Good job, Elsa. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you to uh, Elsa and to Dr. Mattis.